Brother Ifan, we are on live. You can start talking. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. And we are live now. Great. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to all participants out there from different parts of the world. And I welcome you to the season one of international webinar series on research methodology on social sciences. Five, 10 or 20 years ago, I could have never imagined that I will be hosting world's leading researchers like Professor Islam to ignite young minds like you. Joining us today is one of the amazing academicians, researchers, and one of the specialty about today's speaker is he loves to help budding scholars in advancing their research career, building their confidence, and helping them to overcome the hurdles they face during their research journey. As you listen to him, you will notice a drive, curiosity, and confidence in you as a researcher. Today, he will be sharing with us foundations of research, which will include tree analogy, research paradigm, and education, which will enable overcoming the hurdles we face during the initial stages of our research. Let us welcome Professor Amin Islam, who is Professor of Business Innovation and Technopreneurship at University of Malaysia, Perlis. Professor Islam, it is good to see you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for accepting our invitation. And before we yep. proceed and go live, I have with me here Professor Parvez Ahmed Mir, who is research coordinator in the Department of Management Studies. I now invite Parvez Ahmed Mir sir, to give initial remarks before we go live. And Professor Islam will start his session. And also, I will like to introduce Professor Islam is an eminent academician as a professor in the Department of Business Innovation and Technopreneurship at University of Malaysia, Perlis. Before we go live, Professor Parvez would like to join us for the initial remarks here. Assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Actually, it is a nice uh, uh, to talk to you, sir, because uh, the thing is that uh, there is a very strong relationship between our university with uh, Malaysia, particularly the Yusuf University. And uh, in fact, uh, we would like to you your uh, this uh, cooperation uh, uh, with our university as well as with our department also, sir. And uh, definitely, uh, because uh, we need your cooperation with respect to the research and uh, developmental areas and uh, plus faculty exchange for these things. So uh, without wasting much time, because of the things that our students are waiting for they were, uh, this session, sir, uh, it is uh, honor for us that you are with us. And uh, uh, hopefully, uh, we will uh, expect your uh, services in future also. Thank you, and uh, God bless you, sir. You can start your session. Over to you, Professor Islam. Let us start. Yeah. Sure, sure. And I request uh, our friends, if you have any questions, please put your question box so that we can put the questions on the screen. To All right. Uh, can you can you hear me, brother? Yes, Professor, uh, you can start now. Okay, all right. All right, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Uh, uh, Dr. Irfan Bashir, 
as well as uh, Dr. Parvez. Uh, thank you very much uh, for inviting me uh, to this webinar. I have not been in uh, Kashmir, <laughs> never before. So uh, this is the first webinar that I'm conducting uh, for the people of uh, Kashmir, the brothers living in Kashmir. So definitely it is a, a wonderful uh, experience and gives me immense pleasure uh, to, to have participants from Kashmir. I know it's a, it's a beautiful place. Uh, we used to call it uh, the heaven on earth. <laughs> That's how we define Kashmir. I <laughs> uh, hope we will have uh, some opportunity to, to, to go and see you physically uh, and seeing the beautiful place uh, on earth, inshallah. inshallah. All right, now for participants, um, uh, good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening um, uh, as you live in different places. So I'm expecting many more participants to join, so I will start a bit uh, slow. Uh, first of all, um, uh, I, I must uh, congratulate Dr. Irfan Bashir, uh, who has been communicating with me, I think, uh, for about the last three months. And um, uh, I, I couldn't give uh, him the time because of the quite busy schedule. Huh? I'm, I'm almost having, almost every week, I'm having a webinar. So last week, I had a webinar in Pakistan. Uh, today, I'm yes. having in Kashmir. Um, next week, I have one in Indonesia. And then uh, following week, I have one in Iraq. Uh, so in between, I will have one in Bangladesh. So uh, quite packed. <laughs> uh, so but Alhamdulillah, we managed to get uh, uh, you know, uh, convenient time to share some of my understanding and uh, experiences of doing research. Um, I will start a bit slow, because I'm expecting more participants to come. Um, uh, let me share the screen. Uh, uh, for participants, uh, if you have any, those of you who have already joined, uh, you can put your question in the live chat box and brother Irfan Bashir, uh, he will take the questions from there and uh, later I will try to answer those queries and questions that we have. And uh, my technical uh, uh, team here, uh, my, my eldest son as well as my brother Saleh Mansur, uh, they will highlight uh, your comments on the screen. As you see the, on the screen, uh, your question will be on the screen also. Uh, so from that also I can answer uh, questions uh, that you post on the live chat uh, box, okay? That shouldn't be a problem. We'll always put a question on the screen, whatever you have, and later I'll try to answer, okay? And um, uh, once we finish the session, then I will share the slide uh, just beneath, just below, just below uh, the video. Uh, you know my YouTube channel now, uh, the channel that you are in, the program is live now. This is my own YouTube channel. Okay, this is my own YouTube channel. Uh, Platform yes. for Research and Development. That's the name of my YouTube channel. Platform for Research and Development. So possibly you can subscribe. So it would be easier for you uh, to download the slides. I'm going to put it there. So once you subscribe my channel and go to this video, under this video, uh, you will see the slides available for you. At the same time, I will also share the slide with Brother Irfan Bashir uh, so that he can share with his colleagues and friends in Kashmir. So I will do the both. So for, for brothers and sisters in Kashmir, I will share the slide with Brother Irfan Bashir. He will share with you. And uh, for other parts of the world, I will keep the slide just a link just under the video for you. So anytime you can download and you can use it. And uh, if you go to my YouTube channel, you will find uh, there are, I think, about 50 videos already there. Uh, starting from uh, introduction to research until the final Viva Bose, everything there. Okay, so I'm trying to make it um, uh, everything in one place about research. Uh, so uh, I'm going to have more videos there to, to, to help you. And these all are free. All right, these all are free. And uh, all the webinars I do also are free. Yeah? All, all free. Now let me share the screen and start the session. Okay, uh, give me a few seconds to share the screen. But if you have any questions, please post questions in the chat box, not in the comments. That by doing that, we can All right. complete every post. So uh, that's the topic uh, uh, I, we, we decided, right, uh, Brother Dr. Mm -hmm. Ifan Mashi, nuts and bolts of research. <laughs> so if you look at any electronic uh, machine, uh, all the other parts are glued together, then it becomes a machine. So to glue it together, to fix, uh, different parts of machine together, we need some nuts and bolts, right? <laughs> uh, 
So those nuts and bolts are the most important part, even though it looks smaller, okay? But most precious, most important uh, elements uh, for a machine, okay? So we are going to look at that, important aspects of research. Uh, so let me start with definition. This is a very bookish definition. We say research is an organized, objective, and systematic process to uh, study a particular problem that needs a solution. So here you have to uh, keep in mind that research begins with a problem. We have to identify and define a problem that needs solution. Something that is affecting the society, bothering us, affecting the industry, creating problem for the industry to run or society or the country or the world. So we have to take that problem in hand and then we have to conduct a research which supposed to be or should be very organized and systematic process, okay? That's why sometimes we call it systematic process or uh, scientific process. Now, when it's research it starts, uh, we call it a research journey because it's not that easy task to be completed. When you start research, you cannot simply just start. You need to have some preparation before we start doing research. And that's why you call it voice of discovery or a journey. So if you are planning for a journey, say, for example, you want to travel uh, from one side of Kashmir to another side, uh, you will not simply morning wake up and you start uh, traveling. Uh, before you start, you, you, you will plan your, you know, uh, pack your baggage and luggage. You will plan for whatever you want to do, what are the things you need, and all that you'll prepare before you start. So for a research also, you need to have that, okay? You will need to definitely have uh, some kind of uh, preparation before you start a research, okay? And then it is an experience of, it's a method of critical thinking. Uh, research basically requires a lot of inquisitiveness in you, all right? We got to be very inquisitive. Our mind got to be open and we have to keep asking questions, questioning after questioning and after questioning. And that's how we will identify and define the problem. And then we'll find out the right kind of research design and all that, okay? Now, uh, in a typical uh, scientific inquiry, uh, that's the picture looks like, right? People uh, spend a lot of time. It's about a lot of time, a lot of effort, and even a lot of money, all right? That's how research is being done, and that's how we are saying it is a journey. Now, conceptualizing a research study, uh, will you start with the research problem? That is the very beginning, uh, the very basic for a research. So we have to identify and define a research problem. And then that will be translated into research questions, research objectives, and research hypotheses. So if you are wrong in identifying and defining the research problem, it will affect the subsequent stages, like risk, formulating research questions, research objectives, research hypotheses, uh, identifying or deciding on which research approach to be taken, which research design to be selected, uh, with data collection method to be adopted, and all that will be affected, all right? So the most important, uh, I would say, the nuts um, is a research problem, and then you will have the bolts to tie it up, okay? So research problem is the first nut of research, and then the bolts will be your research questions, objectives, and uh, research hypotheses. So that will tie up and make it a good research uh, problem, okay? And from there, we will uh, fix up some other elements of research. So in any empirical research, these are the components uh, we have. We'll start with the research problem, and uh, that's what I said in art, and then you have the boards there, research questions and research objectives. Then we need to have research underpinning theories. Uh, you cannot have a research without theory, okay? Unless if you are doing qualitative research, then you do not need a theory. We start with uh, 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 fresh and new, okay? So we start with the theory, and then you will have some uh, nuts there, okay? Uh, and then you will have a theoretical framework. We construct hypotheses. We'll have operation definition of uh, variables, all that I'll talk about later. We'll have uh, to decide on research design and methodology instrumentation sampling, then we collect the data, then we conclude and recommend, okay? This is a standard uh, component. Uh, these are the standard components of empirical research that we got to uh, follow. Now, uh, let me go through this, the tree analogy. Uh, this is something that 
uh, I uh, came out with, I'm comparing uh, research with a tree, okay? Uh, so that's how I put it, uh, basically. Um, a tree uh, consisted of many things, right? If you have a tree where the root is very strong, but the body is not strong, the body, the tree will not stand. And if the tree body is very strong, but the roots are weak, uh, the tree again will not stand, okay? And then uh, if the roots are strong, body is strong, and then no fruits, uh, so then there's no value of the tree. So in a research, I'm comparing uh, with uh, the roots as a um, research problem. So it has gone out, is it? Can you see? There, right? Okay. So the tea roots, I'm comparing with research problem. Uh, if, 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 if a tree having problem, uh, then um, uh, you will see at the top, uh, possibly the leaves will be uh, yellowish or leaves will be dropping. But the problem definitely comes from the root, possibly because of the quality of the soil, quality of the water, you know, uh, uh, lack of water and uh, possibly fertilizations are needed, all that. You've got to identify what is affecting. So research problem with like that, uh, research problem got to be identified from where it is occurring. The root of the problem got to be identified. If the root of the problem in the society, then we have to identify from the, from the society. If it's affecting the industry, then you got to look at the industry and see how it is affecting the industry and so on, okay? And I'm comparing the body of a tree with theoretical framework uh, because that decide, you know, basically uh, your subsequent stages of research. So in a tree, if it is, uh, the body is strong, then it will be able to carry the branches of the tree and the fruits. If you have a lot of fruits and heavy fruits, then the body got to be stronger, okay? So... Uh, then the underpinning theory, uh, when you have the branches of it, th the tree, I'm comparing with that with the underpinning theories. In a research, i uh, got to be supported by theories. It could be supported by one theory, we call it underpinning theory. Uh, there could be a few more theories, we call it supporting theories. So main theory, we call it underpinning theory, the supporting, the other theories, we call it supporting theory. So in a tree, you can have a stronger branches, that will be main theory, and the other branches of a tree will be supporting theories. And the leaves of the tree that actually beautify the tree, whether the tree looks beautiful or not, it depends on uh, uh, the leaves, you know, the, the size of the leaves, the color of the leaves, and all that. So in a research, literature review basically beautifies your research. Uh, when you are writing a paper or you are writing PhD draft or any research draft, the beautification of the draft is made by research uh, literature review, whereby you look at previous research and then you show it all right, uh, to people, that people have done this and uh, that's what is missing, you know, and you want to do something uh, from there. And your contribution of research, I compare that with uh, the trees, of, uh, sorry, the fruits of a tree. So the fruits of a tree is basically tells you uh, what you get from the tree, okay? So uh, uh, a research outcome would be like a fruits of the tree, okay? So if a tree having problem at the root, Definitely, you may not get the right kind of fruits that you'd like to get. It is the same for a research. If a, a research having problem, you know, we have problem identifying, formulating research problem, then you will have problem of getting the right outcome. Okay. So these all are the nuts. I call them. Huh? These all are the nuts. These all are the nuts uh, of of research. Okay. And uh, uh, the data collection got to be from the root, and then your data quality and robustness of analysis. That will fix the problem of the tree, right? Uh, when you collect data, definitely look at the root of the tree. You look at whether the soil are too uh, uh, solid, whether there's lack of water, whether you need some nutrition, uh, some fertilizers and all that. So you have to collect the data from there. So in research, we will collect the data from where the problem is rooted, all right, where the problem is rooted. So if the problem is rooted in the industry, you've got to collect the data from the industry. If the problem is rooted among individuals like employee, you collect the data from in individuals, the employee. If the problem is rooted among the organization, then we collect data from organization. So that's how we look at eh? the problem uh, research data got to be collected from where the problem is rooted. Otherwise, the purpose of doing research should be uh, just defeated, okay? All right, let me uh, continue with next slides. The categories of research. Uh, so we have number of categories of research that we know. 
Um, I would put it in a simple one. Uh, qualitative research, quantitative research, and we do have now uh, mixed method research. Qualitative research is basically we try to understand human behavior and the reason that governs such behavior, okay? So we try to go deeper into a problem, whereby quantitative research, we do a systematic empirical investigation of quantitative properties, all right? So basically in quantitative research, the data got to be numerical and it's supposed to be su supported by statistical analysis. That's quantitative research. But in the qualitative research, we collect the data, it may not be numerical, it could be conceptual, it could be just content, you know, and uh, we may not use statistical method uh, to test hypothesis for a qualitative research. But again, we have to keep in mind that we do have some very good software now, in vivo, Atlas T and all that. Uh, those software does help us to do uh, some good analysis in qualitative research. And the third one, um, the mixed method research, which we subscribe now. Uh, for me, uh, most of my PhD students now, I will always advise them to uh, follow uh, or adopt mixed method research. Uh, quantitative research, uh, we do have certain limitations because it is limited to data that we have. We cannot go beyond that. And uh, qualitative research, you go deeper into uh, uh, the problem and uh, then uh, there is no limit of it, you know. We can go as much as we can go the deeper into the issues. But again, once we get the data, um, to develop a theory is not that easy, you know. So we can just uh, come out with some hypothesis and then it has to be followed by quantitative research to verify and validate the findings of qualitative research. And for that reason, we now advise uh, researchers to follow mixed method research, whereby we combine qualitative and quantitative methods for data collection and analysis. Now, um, this is how uh, we combine uh, triangulation, as we call it, combination or merger of qualitative and quantitative method. Okay, we use simultaneously, uh, we may have even uh, a series of uh, data collection analysis. We can start with qualitative, followed by quantitative, then again validating by qualitative. Uh, we may have quantitative precedes uh, the qualitative and all that. So the idea is basically, you know, even a quantitative research, we start with uh, identify a problem, then consulting with academician and industry uh, experts. That is also qualitative research. Then we identify research paper, we read and try to understand the research problem. That is also qualitative research, you know. And then from there, we develop theoretical framework, we design questionnaire, we collect data, do quantitative analysis, become quantitative. So basically, uh, most of the research, uh, there is an element of qualitative as well as quantitative. But if you do uh, qualitative research, you may have only qualitative, but followed by with some software, you may have some quali quantitative analysis also. Okay, so this is how uh, the cycle is. We start with qualitative, followed by quantitative, and then we got to do qualitative again because the quantitative findings may show you uh, uh, you know some different kind of findings from qualitative we got to validate and we got to expand the research we may continue with qualitative and that continues you know through qualitative research we develop a, a theory or we propose some hypothesis and then in quantitative research we test those hypotheses or we validate the theory and that process continues now, let me uh, move into a very important element of research. Um, we must understand that uh, research is a very systematic and uh, scientific process of defining, identifying a problem and finding solutions to it, okay? And um, those of us who have done PhD, PhD is practically, basically doctor of philosophy, right? We don't call it doctor of finance or doctor of management, we call it doctor of philosophy. So there must be some philosophical underpinning or philosophical uh, foundation of the research that you do. Huh? That is basically research paradigm. So let me quickly go through this and uh, then I will follow on to uh, research design and other research approaches. Research paradigm, as Kuhan in 1970 defined, is a set of common beliefs and arguments shared between scientists or among scientists. And it is about how problems should be understood and address. That's what you call research paradigm. Huh? So in short, research paradigm is basically understanding and addressing a problem. Understanding and addressing a problem. And that's the purpose of doing research, right? We identify 
and define a research problem and we follow a scientific systematic process and at the end we address the problem meaning that we have some solutions to the problem so research paradigm is a world view about conducting research uh, so that answers the questions of you know how should we start uh, uh, writing literature review and all that we start with world view and then regional and then come back to the context your country where research is taking place so, and then um, Research paradigm basically provides the researchers an idea to choose methods and research design, okay? So to understand the problem, once we understand the problem, then we would be uh, clear of uh, selection of the right kind of research methods, you know, and uh, the right kind of research design uh, to, to come out with the solution of the problem. All right. Um, so when it comes to research paradigm, uh, broadly, we look into uh, two things. One is ontology, and other one we call is epistemology, OK? Uh, ontology is basically uh, the study of being, uh, study of being. So saying that is basically uh, we look at uh, what actually exists in the world about the humans uh, can acknowledge. So we, we are looking at what is existing and from there, we acquire, we try to understand the phenomena and acquire knowledge. Knowledge is basically having possession of information, okay? I'm going to show you a slide defining what do we mean by knowledge, all right? Uh, most, of we, most of us, we always talk about knowledge, data, information without really knowing exact meaning of it. So I'm going to have a slide on it. So ontology basically helps researchers uh, uh, recognize how certain uh, they can be about the nature and existence of objects they are researching. So ontology basically have the researchers to look at the nature and existence of the process and the problem uh, that we would like to tackle in our research, okay? So it's basically looking at uh, how true, uh, you know, the, the case is, uh, what extent of really the problem is affecting the people, okay? And uh, looking at the legitimacy of what is real, what is not real, okay? And how do researchers deal with different and conflicting ideas of reality? So when you identify and define a problem, the problem may have many different direction, many different dimensions, you know, and uh, you may find conflicting opinions uh, and conflicting solutions to the problem. For example, now on the COVID-19, as we go through now, uh, we have many different kind of vaccines and we do not know which one really works, right? <laughs> there, is no, there is no established truth yet, which one is really working or which one is not working, okay? So when you identify a problem like that and you have a solution, you may have conflicting ideas on the reality. So ontology basically tells you that identifying different kind of uh, you know, solutions available and understanding the truth of uh, the reality uh, that is uh, we are facing now. Now, uh, under the ontology, we, we do have two different kind of way uh, looking at. Uh, the first one, we look at realist ontology, whereby we uh, uh, will feel that the existence of one single reality which can be studied, okay, understood and experienced the truth, meaning that uh, uh, for realist ontologies, uh, they look at uh, uh, only one solution to a problem, okay. So when there is a problem, there is only one truth, there is only one single element or dimension of a problem. But if you are looking at relativist ontology, uh, this philosophy basically uh, claims that uh, there's no one reality uh, is true, okay? No one true reality exists. So you are not looking at only one solutions. We are looking at uh, different solutions given the time and places, okay? Now, uh, the solutions that we have uh, may not be always working at all the time, right? So it depends on the time, depends on the person, depends on the place and all that. A medicine that works very well in Kashmir may not be working very well in Malaysia, you know? The food that uh, make you a stronger immune system in your body in Kashmir may not be the same as in Malaysia, okay? So that's what we are looking at. So once you identify and define a problem, uh, the solution may not be universal. You may have a solution, but may not work in different contexts and different people, different time and different places, all right? That's what ontology uh, propagates, all right? So we have realist ontologies, so they look at only one solution to a problem, but relativist ontologies, uh, they look at uh, different dimensions of a problem and try to find 
different solutions at for the different time and different places and different contexts. All right, whereby epistemology is totally different, right? Ontology and epistemology. Epistemology is the term itself comes from the ep episteme, uh, the Greek word which means the knowledge, all right? So epistemology is going into straight uh, to the word of knowledge. Meaning basically, uh, we the epistemology describe how uh, to know something or how to know the truth or reality. So now here is a process of knowing the truth. Uh, ontology, just looking at whether the truth exists and that truth is one or more than, uh, reality is more than one. But here is different. Uh, here we are looking at the process of how can we understand what is happening, okay? So the knowledge, its nature, nature and forms and how it can be acquired and how it can be communicated to other human beings. That is epistemology. So in a research, uh, you will have definitely both uh, philosophy there, right? Ontology and epistemology. But in epistemology, we have different formats and we will look at that after this slide and we try to understand it, all right? So epistemology basically focuses on the nature of human knowledge and comprehension that the researcher can possibly acquire or be able to extend, broaden, and deepen the understanding of the field of research and then communicate with other human beings in different parts of the world, okay? So epistemology has deeper meaning. Researcher will try to understand the nature of the knowledge, existing knowledge, try to comprehend it, and then try to acquire it and possibly extend it, broaden it and deepen it, all right? Deepen understanding of it and then after that communicate with some other people. So that's basically what we do in research, right? We start with identification and definition of research problem. And then we choose a research design, a research approach. Then we do literature review to understand uh, the, the existence of knowledge, to what extent it is there. Uh, there's a need of verification. Uh, there's a need of extension. There's a need of modification and all that. All right. And then once we have the outcome of research, then we'll communicate with other human beings, other researchers that you do. Okay. Now, that's how it goes. Huh? A research is start with ontology. So we are looking at what is the reality. So in ontology, I said there are two different group, right? Uh, so uh, it could be just one reality, but it could be more than one, different dimension of a reality. So you have to define that at the beginning of the research. That's what we call it ontology. And then we follow on, uh, we proceed on to epistemology. Uh, what and how can I know the reality of knowledge, right? So now in epistemology, you are looking at the process itself. How are you going to uh, know, you know, the existing of uh, existence of the reality, whether you have different dimension and all that, and what is uh, affecting uh, the, or, or what is contributing to the, uh, the problem that we have, that is epistemology. From there, we proceed on the theoretical perspective. What approach can we use to get the knowledge? So now we will have two approaches. We'll look at it, uh, inductive and deductive. I will have slides on it and I'll discuss about it. And then we proceed to methodology. What procedure can you use to acquire knowledge? Now we are going into procedures, right? So possibly we'll hear, we'll talk about research design. What tools can we use to acquire the knowledge? So now we are talking about qualitative method or quantitative method. And then you are looking at data sources. Are you going to look at primary sources or secondary sources. You are collecting primary data, secondary data, all right? So this is a comprehensive philosophical view of a research. We start with ontology, proceed to epistemology, then we proceed to theoretical perspective. We look at methodology, then method, and then we look at the sources where we can collect the data, all right? Uh, if you have any questions, please put that at this moment in the chat box, and later I will try to answer. Uh, if you have any queries or any debates, any disagreement on the presentation, I will try to handle that. Uh, we'll open up the session for you, right? Uh, but again, the session is online. You have to put the questions on the live chat box and I'll try to handle that. Now, uh, this is uh, the three, these are the three uh, main stream when you look at epistemology, okay? Uh, we divide them into three groups, uh, positivist, constructivist, and pragmatics, okay? Uh, we do have also researchers, they will combine constructivists and pragmatists together and make it one, okay? And positivists is just one, okay? 
positivists uh, believe uh, that there is a single reality and which can be measured and known. Therefore, they are more likely to be quantitative methods to measure this reality, right? Because in the quantitative method, uh, we, we collect the data, we will have a statistical method, we accept or reject hypothesis. So there's only one reality. We cannot go beyond that. But constructivists believe there is no single reality or truth. Therefore, reality needs to be interpreted and uh, they are more likely to use qualitative methods, okay, to get multiple realities, okay. So that's what he said earlier, right, in ontology, either you have a single reality or you have multiple realities. So constructivists, uh, constructivists believe that there are multiple uh, realities, okay. And pragmatists believe the reality is constantly renegotiated, debated, interpreted. Okay. So here possibly we lose multi, uh, you know, combination of mixed method, combination of qualitative and quantitative research. So positivists here we lose quantitative. If it's constructivist, we lose qualitative method. And if it's pragmatist, we will use mixed method research, which I have discussed earlier okay now uh, this slide is a very beautiful slide it uh, summarizes uh, the philosophical foundation of a research so ontology we are looking at what is the reality all right and then we have a positivism oriented and we have interpretivism oriented the two broader groups earlier i've shown you three but here as i said earlier many researchers believe there can be uh, you know, uh, combine and uh, the, so that's how they combine it. So if it is positivism oriented research, then we divide into two, positivism and post-positivism. So in the positivism, ontology is basically looking at objective uh, reality. In epistemology, you are looking at uh, dualism, uh, like researcher and research. Uh, we look at uh, the replicable uh, findings, right? So we're looking at past research, which can be um, uh, taken again and uh, we do and uh, replicate it, can be replicated and then you do on research again. Uh, this positivism. What methodology do we use? It's going to be experimental, it's going to be deductive, it's mainly going to be quantitative, and we'll look at cause and effect relationship when you do statistical analysis, okay? So that's the positivism. So looking at this column, once you identify a research problem and you start conducting the research, then you have to take a stand. Either you are following the positivism philosophy or post-positivism philosophy or interpretivism philosophy or constructivism philosophy, okay? So this is the first one. If you're positivism, you are looking at the objective reality, uh, you are replicating the previous work, possible, right? It's going to be experimental, deductive, and quantitative research. That's how it is. If it is a post-positivism philosophy, then ontology, you are looking at critical realism. So reality is imperfectly apprehendable, okay? So you are looking at the reality, uh, you are not just accepting as it is. So you are being critical, you are being inquisitive, uh, uh, you are using more analytical mind to look at the problem, going to deeper into it, and you are looking at different dimension of a problem, right? That's what you look at. Here, you are saying dualism is not possible, meaning that you are not really, you are saying that replication find is probably true. So, but probably true, huh? probably true, but there could be new findings, okay? So, you might not be fully replicating your study, rather, you may follow the previous research and then you may have your own uh, inference. You may have introduced new variables or you may be validating or nullifying a theory or extending a theory, all right? So, here you try to, uh, uh, explain more uh, than uh, the earlier positivism part that you have, okay? So this is further extension of positivism, post-positivism. If you are following this uh, philosophy, then your research uh, definitely is going to be uh, experimental. It would be a quantitative method. It's manipulative because you are looking at different dimension of a research problem. It's a scientific community plays an important role in validation. As I said earlier, it might be validating or extending a theory, right? Uh, and then here is very specific. We might be using probability sampling. I'll be talking about that later. And the other group of researchers, the philosophers, uh, they fall in uh, interpretivism, okay? Interpretivism oriented, uh, interpretivism oriented. 
Here we will again divide into two, interpretivism and constructivism. All right. So interpretivism, basically, uh, we interpret the knowledge and we try to understand the reality happening there. Uh, so this one, uh, mainly qualitative research, uh, is, is purposive or multipurposive uh, sampling is used for here. All right. So you are not going to re really, um, uh, what do you call that? Uh, once you have a findings, you are not going to try to uh, 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 make it like, you know, for everyone. All right. So that, that's the interpretivism. And constructivism, here you, we will construct the knowledge. Okay. Uh, in interpretivism, we interpret the knowledge, but here we'll construct the knowledge. Okay. So the reality can be constructed. So it is more difficult, advanced stage than the interpretivism. So here you have a theory, and from there you are extending it, or you are coming out possibly a new theory. All right. So it is completely qualitative method. So if you look at that, Positivism oriented, if you follow this philosophy, research would be quantitative, all right? And if you are following interpretive, interpretivism oriented philosophy, then your research is going to be qualitative. So post -positive, positivism is the extension of positivism and constructivism is the extension of interpretivism, okay? So in positivism, we just understand uh, what is happening with replicated research, so we accept it. But post-positivism, we will extend from there. We look at different possibilities and we try to uh, come out with a solution to, uh, of, uh, you know, to tackle the different dimension of a problem. Whereby in interpretivism, uh, we try to understand and uh, interpret the knowledge, existing knowledge. But in constructivism, uh, we will try to construct a new knowledge. Completely a new theory uh, will be developed and uh, shared with other researchers, that is constructivism, all right? So uh, I think I have enough uh, explained a lot on this. Uh, in the first week of May, uh, I'm going to have an webinar on uh, ontology and epistemology, I think would be organized by one of the Iraqi universities. Uh, so possibly you may join there. Uh, you can follow me, I have given you uh, my WhatsApp uh, number. You can uh, WhatsApp me and then I will include you in a WhatsApp group of webinar. And then you will be updated from there. All right. Or even you can join me in my Facebook. Uh, you can you can just type Aminul Islam. I think you will get that, uh, my Facebook. Uh, I'll, I'll do update always the webinars that I have. Okay. Then you can join those webinars. All right. Uh, I think I have to end it here on this. Uh, let me proceed to research approaches. So I have tackled the research paradigm. I think it's enough for you at this moment to understand it. Uh, and we will... Uh, drill through to understand more, possibly with a two-hour session. Now, research approaches, uh, once we uh, decide on the philosophical foundation or underpinning for a research, uh, then we will proceed to research approaches. The research approaches are basically two, all right? Uh, one is called deductive and the other one is inductive, okay? So deductive research is basically you have an established theory, from the theory, we construct hypothesis, then we collect the data, analyze it, and finally we decide whether the hypothesis has been accepted or rejected. All right, that's a deductive research. It's basically quantitative research. Okay, it's basically quantitative research. Uh, earlier, as I have shown you, uh, the two different group of uh, uh, thinkers, right? Positivism and constructivism. So this is on the positivism. Okay, this is on positivism. So we use quantitative approach. You got a theory there. And then uh, from there, we construct hypothesis, we collect data, and then we accept or reject deductive, you know, the, the hypothesis that we have constructed. And uh, I put it in a simple uh, a picture there to explain it better. As I said, that deductive research, you start with the theory. So this is like you are in a garden. You are landed in the garden, and then uh, there's a beautiful garden, the all flowers are there, but you may not take all. You will only choose the one you feel relevant and useful for you, okay? So this is deductive research. You have everything there. So you have a theory, and from those theories and literature, we pick up the variable, and we put them in the framework, and we'll test them with the data collected, all right? So that is deductive approach. This is positivism, okay? Uh, the, the theoretical, the philosophical approach. The other one, we call it inductive research. So in inductive research, we'll observe a phenomenon from there, we try to analyze the pattern, then we formulate relationship, and at the end, we might come out with uh, a theory. If you cannot come out with a theory, at least 
we will propose some hypothesis which can be tested in quality quantitative research. So this is definitely a qualitative approach. It is constructivism, right? It's constructivism philosophy. Constructivism philosophy. So if you're following constructivism philosophy, then the approach would be inductive approach. So inductive approach, you start with zero. You are observing a phenomenon. So you are looking at uh, organization, you are looking at the society or country and uh, identifying and defining the problem. You analyze the pattern, we formulate uh, the relationship and we develop a theory with the data that you have collected. And this is uh, the way how I show it, uh, the inductive approach, all right? So it's like you are landing in a, uh, on a solid ground, uh, there's nothing there. So you plow the land, uh, you plant the tree, you fertilize the tree, water the tree, and finally you have your own garden. So this garden is based on what you wanted. As you planted, right? As you planted the tree, uh, the kind of tree, you get the fruits as the plant, you know? So this is inductive research. So you have a problem in hand, you define it, and then you continue collecting data. You go deeper into it and you take time. And then finally, you come up with a theory uh, with a certain hypothesis and all that. All right. So this is inductive approach. So this is constructivism, right? This is constructivism. All right, so there are basically two research approaches, inductive and deductive, right? And I have also linked it with the research philosophies that you have, um, ontology and epistemology have connected that clearly so that it should be easily understood by you. Now, uh, so I have covered the research uh, paradigm. I have, I have covered the research approaches. Uh, let me now proceed to research design. Uh, there are many kinds of research designs there. Uh, definitely, I won't take too long time because I got few more other areas to cover. So when you have research design, um, we have many kind. Number one, reporting. Uh, depending on the kind of research problem that is identified and defined, if the problem needs just a, a summation of you know data, the casting of data uh, to achieve deeper understanding or generate statistics for comparison, so you will proceed to uh, a reporting kind of research, right? The kind of study. This kind of study is kind of going to be reporting. We just report. We collect the data, we summarize them, we tabulate them, and we just report them, okay? Without really much uh, statistical analysis and all that. Descriptive. Uh, depending on the kind of problem that we have identified, uh, we may just try to discover answer to the questions like uh, who, what, when, where, and uh, how, okay? So how the, the answer of how most of the time may not be there in the descriptive, but the answers of who, what, when, and where would be always there in a descriptive kind of study. Okay. So it could be qualitative, it could be quantitative, but the answers are basically descriptive. Okay. And uh, the third one, uh, we may have even predictive study. Again, depending on the kind of research problem we have identified and def defined, so here's, uh, here the, uh, the researchers will attempt to predict when and what situation and event uh, will occur. It um, may also be described you know, as applied research or basic research. So here, basically, we are looking into a problem. And then uh, we are going to uh, come out with a solution to tell people when that might occur again. That might occur again, right? So, so in an organization setup, in an industrial setup, or the setup that we have in a society or country, things that happen may be repeating again, right? Uh, it's very common. The situation repeats. So in that case, we may conduct a research to come out with some kind of indexing or some kind of theory that will tell you uh, when it might occur again, you know, that kind of solution will be provided. The next one, um, you may have explanatory research design. Uh, again, remember, I always emphasize the kind of problem in here now we have got to look at. So this kind of research design would be uh, always there when uh, a problem is not well researched and it demands priorities and generates operational definitions and provide a better research model. So we are going to uh, have some kind of explanation, all right? some kind of explanation, meaning uh, the research, not many research being done on it, on the topic. And even the solutions available are not uh, uh, adequate or enough. So we got to do a new research, all right? 
finding out, uh, you know, the priorities and uh, uh, generating operation definitions. And uh, we have to provide some kind of new model to solve the existing problem that we have. And then we may have exploratory research design. And uh, this one is a deeper kind of research. So we say is basically investigating a problem which is not clearly defined. Okay. So this is the deep edge, you know, kind of uh, going into a problem. So it is conducted to have better understanding of existing problem, but may not provide a conclusive result. All right. So this is definitely a qualitative research. Uh, you are trying to go into deeper into research. Now, uh, many times I see students, especially PhD students in final Viva Bose, we see a student claim that their research is exploratory, and yet they use deductive and uh, qualitative, right? So, uh, quantitative. So that cannot be exploratory research. Exploratory research basically most of the time would be inductive and would be qualitative, all right? It is difficult for a quantitative research uh, to be conducted using exploratory research designs. So you got to be very careful, all right? So here we are saying that an important aspect uh, of exploratory research design is that researchers should be willing to change his or her direction subject to the revelation of new data insights. So you can shift the kind of research you know uh, 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 you would like to proceed with. You may shift your data collection method from one method to another method. You may change the idea of uh, different uh, analysis of data and all that. So this is definitely qualitative research. You are moving from one to another. All right. So these are the research design that I talked about. Um, so there are five types I talked about, and this can be all connected to research approaches and research paradigms. These all are interlinked and interconnected. Uh, we always have to remember uh, that research when you conduct is just one piece of work, all right? So one piece of is like one machine. One machine, every part is connected to each other, right? And to connect each part of it, we need some nuts and bolts, all right? <laughs> and that's what I'm looking at it today. We have different parts and nuts of research, and we need some bolts to, uh, you know, uh, uh, to make it a machine, so make it a complete research. So that's how I'm talking about it. I started with research paradigm, and then uh, uh, the research design and research approaches, right? And let me now move on to language of research. Uh, when you do research, there are few jargons, a few terms are, uh, are there, which you always use, okay? It is a common language of research, and every researcher should be able to understand, define, and explain them very well, okay, in, in any kind of research that you undertake. So these are the common uh, research language uh, we use. Uh, we have concepts, uh, we do have also ideas. From ideas, we have concepts, uh, constructs. We develop theories and models. We do have hypotheses, variables. We have operation definitions. We have theoretical conceptual schemes and all that. So those are the common languages in research we, we use, okay? I'm going to define these terms uh, for you in today's session. So don't worry, uh, let's proceed. I will define one by one slowly. So this is what uh, is a very important slide to me. As a researcher, uh, this slide uh, got to be really understood very well. Uh, this is very basic and fundamental for any person who would like to undertake research. I'm looking at from data up to technology. Uh, so when we say we are collecting data, uh, data are basically raw facts and figure, raw facts and figure. So we are just collecting data. That data may not be, may be useful for me, may not be useful or may be useful for me, but may not be useful for others. So that's what we call it data, the raw facts and figures. And when we scan the data and make it something useful for me, it become information, huh? information because it's useful. Uh, if the data is not useful to me, it is not information to me, okay? So informations are basically, information are basically scanned data or useful data. And when someone had the possession of the information, it become knowledge. Okay, so when you collect data, you scan through the data, you analyze using statistical methods and all that, you find something totally new. That information is your information. Nobody knows about it and only you know. That is the knowledge, having position of information. Eh? When you say this guy is knowledgeable about it, means what? He has the information about something, so he is knowledgeable. Okay, 
And then when somebody has the ability to apply the knowledge, use the knowledge, it becomes technology. All right. Uh, those of you who are sitting with me, listening to me, uh, watching this uh, webinar, uh, I think all of us, we know how a car is produced. So there is knowledge, knowing how the, how is the car, how car is produced. But if the car cannot be made by me, then I don't have the technology to produce a car. Okay. So the BMW and uh, the Mercedes that you see, uh, they had the technology to produce, so they produced the car, right? better car. But we have the knowledge possibly knowing how did they do it, but we do not know how to do it, so we don't have the technology. So these are the jargons that we always see in the, the languages, in research that you always see. Any research paper you read, uh, at least one or two times or three times will be always there in the paper. So data are raw facts and figures. Uh, then informations are basically uh, scan the data, uh, useful data, and then when you have the position of information, you become knowledge, and when you have the ability to apply the knowledge, we call it a technology. Now, um, as I promised to uh, uh, Dr. Irfan, uh, I'm going to propose or uh, show you an innovative template to plot a research problem, okay? Now, a uh, research problem is a serious problem. <laughs> Identifying and defining research problem is the toughest part of research, okay? It's like when a patient is going to see a doctor, uh, the toughest part is to identify what kind of disease he has. If the doctor is able to identify the right kind of disease, the rest of the jobs are very easy for him, right? He gives the medication and all that. But to identify the right kind of disease, he may have to do many things, all right? So talking to you, looking at your history and all that, if he can identify very easy, but if he cannot, he might have to do a blood test. If he cannot identify, he might have to do some, you know, uh, scanning and uh, some more operation. And there are many things goes on. In a research problem, is like that. Uh, some problems are easily identifiable. Some are not. Some are really, really complex. So that takes a lot of time and effort, you know, for you uh, to, to define, identify and define a research problem. So I'm proposing and sharing... Uh, a template that might makes your that might makes your life easy uh, to define and identify and define a research problem. So that's how I put it. Okay, um, if you look at the top, I have put the title of the research. This is a PhD research of my own student, who has completed two years before. So his title of research was financial risks, business risks, and farm value, and he got a moderating variable. It's a moderating role of financial innovation. So looking at the title, financial risk, business risk, and the farm value, you know the dependent variable here is farm value. So in a research, when you talk, um, and uh, we do research, we have to always remember that the main problem is the dependent variable. If you are doing a study on employee job satisfaction, the satisfaction, job satisfaction become dependent variable. That is the main problem. And those issues, factors, Contributing to the job satisfactions are the independent variable. Those become sub problem. Okay, so that's how it makes it easy with this template that I'm proposing and uh, sharing with you now. What we do, we look at the main problem. For this research, the main problem was the farm value. The farm value is affected by different kind of business risks. So he has put that issue one credit risks, issue two liquidity risks, issue three operational risks, and so on. And finally, he got one more issue that is financial innovation. That what he put it as moderating. Okay, so if you are successful in identifying the issues uh, that are contributing to the research problem, so if you are looking at the issue that contribute to the dependent variable, independent variable to dependent variable, it's very easy now. You know, each issue is an independent variable, or moderating or mediating variable, and your main problem is the dependent variable. Now, this part, I think most of the students, they know how to do it or researchers, they do it. Uh, the most problematic part is when you do research, we become too academic, all right? And that's why many people will argue that PhD research they don't really like because it's too academic. And that's why I'm proposing that once you have identified the knowledge gaps and all that, you can also look at the industrial side. Uh, so we look at contextual, industrial, or practical issues, and we put them, put them in the template. So your main problem was farm value, right? My farm value. But here, why the farm value is affected? Because the poor management of risks by 
uh, the, the, the leadership of an organization. So how the risks are managed, uh, that the problem can be identified from the industry. For example, this student has looked at high non-performing loans. He looked at weak liquidity management, high level of fraud and weak internal control system and inaccurate, inaccurate, uh, uh, adequate uh, capital. So now if you look at, he is going into the root of the problem, where it is occurring. So he's getting the issues from the industry as well as he is getting the issues from the knowledge level, all right? So from theoretical knowledge gap can be, can be identified from this plot, you put that in the plot, and here, uh, sorry, and, and, okay. So here basically we have uh, the knowledge gap, you know, knowledge gap or theoretical gap, the main problem and all other problems being plotted, and that's how you will identify dependent and independent variables. And then you are going to look at into the industry and finding out the right kind of uh, uh, problem that is affecting the industry. When I attend a PhD final viva process session, either as internal examiner, external examiner, or as a chairman, you know, or as a supervisor, the weakest point you always find in the student, they are good in identifying the knowledge gap. But it has to be backed up, supported by the industry issues, which they are very poor in it, all right? So we have to have backups. If we have your knowledge gap, industry gap, knowledge gap or theoretical gap been identified, it got to be supported with some industrial issue. That makes your argument stronger, okay? That define your problem precisely, you know? Anybody look at your draft, they say, okay, these are the knowledge issues and these are the industrial issues. And they combine together, it really define the research problem very well. So this template is a very innovative one and a very new one. That's what I have come out on my own. And I'm very sure it's going to help you a lot, you know, to identify and define the research problem. And from here, you will identify your independent, dependent, moderating or mediating variable. And then you plot it in the theoretical framework, which I'm going to talk, it, talk about it afterwards. Now, um, let me move into the theory and theoretical framework. So we talked about uh, philosophical underpinning of a theory. We talk about research approaches. We talk about research design, right? And then we also uh, shared uh, an innovative template where you can plot the research problem of a research. So now I'm moving into theory and theoretical framework. So in a research, as I said earlier, uh, there must be theoretical underpinning. First, philosophical underpinning, we talked about it. And now we are going into the theory and theoretical framework, all right? So a theory is basically a geek term. Huh? Uh, we'll be looking at that from theorem. So it's being developed from, uh, starting from the scratch would be the idea. So idea is something, uh, an abstract, you know, thing that cannot be visualized, cannot be really uh, understood, all right? So from the idea, we develop concept, uh, the next block of the theory. The, the, the concept can be visualized, uh, can be understandable, can be symbolized, okay? So that's concept. From concept, we proceed to the next step would be construct. That's where you will identify the phenomena situation that, you know, cannot be directly observed and yet uh, need to be inferred with certain abstract indicators of phenomena. So here you will have the items, you know, the operation definitions, all that here, construct. Most of the time it will be like a variable, okay? From construct, we proceed to proposition, which is hypothesis. So we look at relationship between uh, different constructs, okay? So once the propositions are, uh, are, are proved, then it become a theory, okay? So this is how it looks like. Uh, a theory comes, we start with ideas, and then we make it a concept, something measurable, something can be visible, okay? It become a concept. And then um, we move to construct, whereby uh, we can even create dimension of a concept and we can measure it with items like questionnaire and all that. And then from there, we move to propositions whereby we assume relationship between construct. And once the propositions are proved, it becomes a theory, okay? Now, uh, let me look at uh, the theoretical framework. From the theory, every theory will have some assumptions and uh, there are factors identified. So. Some factors are called dependent variables, some are independent variable and uh, intervening variable. 
So dependent variable is actually the theme of your research. The main problem of research is your dependent variable. As I give you an example, if you are doing, a, you are looking at employees are satisfied or not satisfied. So you want to look at employee satisfaction. So your dependent variable is employee satisfaction. If you want to look at customer satisfaction on mobile phones, say for example in Kashmir, then uh, the customer satisfaction become dependent variable. And those factors contributing to the dependent variable, for example, the price of mobile phone, the after sales services, the quality of the product, all that, those become independent variable. Okay. And in between these two, independent and dependent, whatever variable you put that in, we call it intervening variable, uh, which can be uh, uh, again uh, divided into two moderating and mediating variable. All right, so we do have also antecedent variable before independent, or we may have outcome variable after dependent variable. Okay, uh, sometimes antecedents could be uh, same as independent for certain research. Outcome variable could be also similar as dependent variable. But again, depending on the context, there could be cases where you may have antecedent before independent, and you may have outcome after dependent. Okay, uh, not necessarily for research. Now, how to develop uh, a, a theoretical framework? We take materials from uh, literature review and uh, we get support from uh, a theory and then we develop a theoretical framework. This is basically a simple theoretical framework. All right, so this is a PhD thesis title again. So you are looking at factors affecting internet abuse at the workplace. So if you look at internet abuse is the main factor, which is dependent variable, right? And factors contributing to research uh, internet abuse are independent variables. Okay. And as I have mentioned earlier, that any theoretical framework, it must be supported by a theory because you call it theoretical framework, eh? supported by a theory. So, this attitude, subjective norm, and perceived behavioral control, these are the dimension of theory of planned behavior, TPB. Those of you are from management, you will understand it very well. Okay. So, TPB. So, you have a theory, that theory, you call it underpinning theory. So, these are the independent and dependent variable. All right. I'll quickly buzz through. Uh, those of you who would like to know more, you can go to my YouTube channel. I do have developing theoretical framework, two hours lecture on it, so you can understand more on it. All right. So here you can assume three relationships, so it becomes three uh, hypotheses. All right. Hypothesis one, hypothesis two, hypothesis three. Relationship between attitude, internet abuse is hypothesis one, subjective norm, internet service, hypothesis two, and uh, followed by the number three. Okay. And this is how we write the hypothesis. I have written three hypotheses, three different ways. Hypothesis can be written many different ways, all right? Slide will be shared with you. So those of you in Kashmir get it from Brother Irfan, Dr. Irfan. And uh, for this of you, the slide will be available in my YouTube channel with this video. Uh, under this video, I'm going to show you the link. You can download the uh, slide from there. So this is a theoretical framework again. You can see dependent variable, independent variable, and moderating is there. Uh, this is another one, but here I'm going to introduce a new one. You can see here, you have independent and dependent and possibly you may have antecedents also. Huh? As I said earlier, it is not required in most of the research, but some cases you may need antecedent variable. And again, those antecedents are based on theory. If you look at usefulness, ease of use, uh, playfulness, this is the term, theory of ex uh, uh, technology acceptance model. Okay. And uh, if you look at peer culture, supervisor culture, and all those are also supported by theories. So everything that you put in the framework must be supported by theory. Okay. This is another one, right? This is moderating. You have independent and dependent in between is moderating there. This is mediating. All right. Uh, we assume uh, direct effect from independent to dependent and then from independent to mediating, uh, mediating to dependent. Okay. Now, uh, they also have cases whereby you may have outcome variable. So you have independent variable, dependent variable, and after dependent variable, you may have outcome variables, okay? Uh, not all research uh, requires you to have uh, outcome variable. Uh, dependent variable, some topics are a bit hanging uh, type, right? For example, this one, internet abuse. Uh, if somebody asks you, you have identified the factors contribute to internet abuse, but tell me what happens after internet is abused. So what? You know, that question will be there. So when you have that kind of question of so what, uh, then you may have uh, to introduce outcome variables. So after independent variable, you may. So here we are saying if internet is abused, it will contribute to organizational outcomes like work efficiency and security threats. It may contribute to some psychological outcomes of the person who is abusing the internet. He may suffer from depression and loneliness. 
so there are reasons where you may have even outcome variable okay um, we do have cases uh, those of you are coming from economics and finance or accounting we may not have a theoretical framework rather we may have model so we may model it and later we may use spss or stata to run the data all right so you may have econometrics modeling or modeling putting the framework in a model rather than you know putting in a framework so this how it looks like i just give you an example again if you want to learn more how to develop a model you have to go to my youtube channel and uh, watch the video on developing theoretical framework all right i have more explanation there all right so based on these models we 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 construct hypothesis or describe hypothesis and based on this model uh, we collect the data right and we use uh, the right kind of statistical method to analyze okay uh, let me quickly go through these two another another uh, nut of research is sampling so when you identify the problem and then uh, you need to collect the data you may not be able to collect data from everyone uh, affected right so if you are doing a study on customer satisfaction there could be millions so you cannot collect data from everyone all right so we will collect from data from few like you know this is what we are saying that when you buy an orange or, or mango they just give you a slice of it to taste so by having a slice of you know uh, tasting the slice of orange or mango you decide to buy a few kilos of mango but the slice given may be a very good one tastier one but how do you know the rest of the orange are, are the same quality as this <laughs> all right but still uh, we make a conclusion if you like one slice of mango or orange then we decide that all mangoes are good all oranges are good so we decide to buy so same goes to the research we collect data from few and then we generalize it to thousands or millions or billions of people all right and 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 we do have formula of how many to collect and all that so in a sampling basically that's how it works uh, who do you want to generalize the theoretical population what population do we have the access we call it the study population how can we get the access to people uh, you know so though we have the access it becomes sampling frame and then the people who are taken in the study become sample uh, so this is how it works right uh, you have target population then the study population then your sample is very small you can see how many people you are taking in your research you are not taking everyone all right this is another okay this one basically tells you the kind of research sampling methods available in a research uh, these are the nuts right <laughs> these are another bold sampling is a bold uh, nuts and these are the bolds okay so sampling methods are divided into two probability sampling and non probability sampling uh, we use probability sampling only when we can obtain the least of all possible respondents please be very careful and listen uh, carefully okay um, if you can obtain the least of all possible respondents then we will follow probability sampling if we cannot obtain the least of all possible respondents then we follow non probability sample okay uh, number 2 criteria if your research needs a uh, strong generalization then we follow probability sampling if your research does not require strong generalization we follow non probability sampling okay uh, the, the methods available here i cannot really explain now will take very long time uh, we may have different webinar on sampling method hopefully you know and then we can have understanding on each and uh, every one of it uh, alternatively you can go to my youtube channel uh, there is uh, there are many videos on it on sampling methods you can watch and understand it okay what is important here you have to remember that uh, we use probability sampling when two conditions are fulfilled number one the least of possible respondents total respondents is available and you need a strong generalization in that case we use probability sampling and when we cannot obtain the least of all target population and strong generalization is not required then we follow non probability sampling all right the next uh, nut of your research is data collection all right uh, so data collection uh, you can collect primary data or you can collect secondary data looking at the kind of research you are doing if it is a qualitative research is definitely primary if it is a quantitative is definitely 
secondary data. Okay, quantitative would be secondary data. Now, in quantitative research, we do also collect primary data. We can collect data using survey questionnaire, right? If you are de developing a questionnaire and you collect data for the first time, that is also primary data. So primary data can be used for both qualitative and quantitative research. But secondary data can be only used for qualitative, quantitative most of the time. But we do also use for qualitative. Right? For example, published materials or books and uh, you know annual reports, all those also secondary data. That can be also used for qualitative research, okay, depending on the kind of problem that we have. Okay, so uh, if you are following inductive research, uh, then uh, it's different, right? Uh, if you are following deductive, uh, it's different from inductive. If you are following different research design, we'll have different kind of uh, data that got to be collected. So again, it is completely depending on uh, the research problem that is identified and defined. Okay. Uh, again, uh, for data collection, again, uh, there could be two hours webinar, <laughs> two, three hours uh, webinar can be there looking at uh, individual interview, you know, uh, uh, kind of focus group, uh, you can have panel discussion, you can have positive techniques, uh, you have many other methods available there. And uh, survey questionnaire, how to design questionnaire, whether questionnaire should be adopted or Safe design or adapted and all that. You know, it may take uh, simply two to three hours to explain all that. Now, uh, as we understood, basically, uh, today's webinar, the purpose is giving you uh, understanding of every parts of research. That's how you call it nuts and bolts, all right? So we are talking about the nuts and bolts of research rather than going in a very deeper uh, into uh, research, okay? Now, when you are talking about nuts and bolts, this is another one which is very important for you to understand. In need of analysis, if your problem is rooted among individuals, then in need of analysis should be individual. Your problem is rooted into group, then we look at families, extended families, or households. It could be organization, could be department. So it all depends on where the problem is rooted. And based on that, we'll choose what kind of theories we will have. Eh? All theories in management or business or social science are divided into two, individual level theory and organization level theory. If your problem is rooted into individual, we have to choose individual level theory. If your problem is rooted into organization, then you should be selecting organization level theories. Now, uh, this is another nut after data collection. Now we have the data and then you got to do analysis, right? Uh, so data analysis, you can have five, six or 10 webinars, right? <laughs> there are so many different tools available. So for me, just to share the, the kind of the most popular uh, software is available for us. If it is quantitative, we have now uh, most popular one is SPSS, SAM PLS, SAM AMOS, and STATA. Uh, first three can be used for uh, theoretical framework, and uh, STATA would be very specifically for modeling. If you are using AMOS, can be also used for modeling, but STATA is more used for panel data analysis. If you are doing a qualitative research, then we do have two very popular, very effective software. Uh, in vivo and atlas team these two can be used to analyze the data for qualitative research all right uh, with that i would like to conclude today's webinar from my side and then i will uh, pass um, the session to uh, dr Irfan. Uh, let me stop sharing um, and uh, okay where it is uh... all right let me where is Where to stop share? Huh? Where is this? Just give me okay. All right, uh, Dr. Ifan, uh, now I pass the session to you. Um, I, I have done my part, so I leave it to you now. All right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Islam, for really fruitful and. It's on you now, Dr. Ifan. The session is now on you. Uh, I have concluded my delivery, yes. Yes, am, am I audible? Uh, we cannot hear you. Uh, okay, okay. We can hear you. It's okay, okay. No. Please continue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Islam, for a fruitful session. And really, we have tried to crack all the nuts and bolts in research. You have exhaustively covered all the research philosophies, tree analogy was beautiful, which is your trademark. And then 
the patient doctor analogy template for research problem formulation and other things. Now, if we would open for question on session, we have some questions we can ask it by art sprints. I would request you to put the questions on the screen and I will read them for you. Tahista has asked, is is it that we are using both ontology and epistemology in our research? It kind of forms the whole framework of our research, is the question. OK. Uh, basically, in research, ontology and epistemology all will be there. But uh, when it comes to theoretical approach, either we'll go for positivism or constructivism, either one. But ontology and epistemology would be both will be covered. OK. Uh, if you look at uh, the way I define it, uh, right. ontology is something, right? Uh, the truth, but uh, epistemology is going uh, details into it and finding out. But when it comes to philosophical side, we will look at either we go for positivism or we go for constructivism. You have to choose either one. And that will help you to either go for qualitative or quantitative or going for inductive or deductive, you know? So, so that kind of decision you have to take at the beginning. What's the second part of the question, Dr. Right. Infan? Is it kind of uh, forms the whole framework of our research is the second part of the question. Okay. Uh, theoretical framework definitely have to be constructed using uh, the support with the theory or support of theories. So you may have just a theory uh, that become underpinning theories. Uh, or if you have more than one theory, other theories should be uh, supporting theories. Now the question is, do we need to have support from theory for all variables? Uh, definitely. Uh, so then you may argue, how can I contribute new knowledge then? Uh, so you can identify uh, new variables from the suggestions for, few, few, for suggestion for future research. If you read any paper, at the end, the authors will say, uh, we'll have a special paragraph, suggestion for future research. They have not done any research on the topic, but they will propose these are the topic have not been researched, but possibly in future researchers can research it. So you will still have support from literature. Somebody recommended, so you put that in the theoretical framework without supporting a theory. It's acceptable. Thank you, Professor. Another question is uh, from me, Shahid, and uh, it's slightly out of the context, but related with our, our research. What do we do when we can't, when we are confronted with plagiarism? Though this is not the talk of the day, but Still no, it's all right. What do you do when we confront with? Sorry, what do you do when we confront with? I didn't plagiarism. get the question. Sorry. What do we do when we are plagiarism? Plagiarism. Okay. Uh, now is the time of technological advancement, right? We have many softwares available. Uh, you can use Quillboard. There is a software called Quillboard. Quillboard, Q-U-I-L-B-O-T, Quillboard. You can subscribe, it's very cheap. That software will help you exactly how to do rephrasing of the statements that you have. So when you run plagiarism test and turn it in, and then um, Grammarly, there is a software available to help you to correct uh, the sentences and grammar and all that. So proofreading can be done using Grammarly. But we do have a software, we call it Quillboard, which helps you to come out with the plagiarism. It will rephrase all the sentences you have, and that uh, you'll be out of plagiarism, inshallah. Thank you, Professor. Another question is from Taiba. How do we adopt more constructivistic in our research? Sorry, uh, you are breaking up. I think internet problem. Can you say it again? <laughs> The question is, how do we adopt a more constructivistic approach in our research? OK, OK. Uh, uh, it looks, it, it depends on the research problem that you have identified. Uh, once you have a research problem in hand, uh, then if you really want to understand the problem, uh, you want to understand the, the kind of knowledge, uh, mm -hmm. and, and then you would like to expand from it, then it's going to be constructivism, right? Uh, so it, it all depends on you, uh, the scope. When you define the scope of the research, uh, you got to broaden it. You got to broaden it so that uh, you can expand the, the current knowledge that you have. OK, so it all depends on you, uh, your approach and uh, uh, to research and the scope that when you define the scope of research, that's where we'll define 
whether you are going to have constructivism or you know post constructivism and all that the second question is from the same participant it is the problem is that such techniques are mostly branded as less empirical and therefore are less valid this is the second part of the same question okay um i i wouldn't agree with that i wouldn't agree with that uh, because uh, once you decide on the philosophy uh, then you will have uh, the next followed up procedures right you uh, you will have to have right uh, research approaches uh, see right research design then uh, you have your theoretical framework you collect the data you use the right statistical tool to validate and all that definitely uh, if you are following qualitative again you do have softwares like in vivo and atlas t all that that will help you to do come out with all those problem of validation and all that right and the second question is how how can we increase acceptance of activistic and interpretive activistic research within the wider academic circles now uh, when you do research there are few things that uh, are very important right uh, number one um, the kind of literature review we do and the kind of theoretical uh, you know analysis uh, identifying the right kind of theory and all that is very important and after that you look at the robustness of analysis okay uh, most of the time when you see uh, once you get the data we do analysis and uh, we just present the data we stop there uh, that's the weakness of many research uh, but once you have the data you run it and you have the output you have to have extensive explanation of your findings all right that that makes your research something uh, different from others okay you have to show to people what is new and how do you interpret them how do we relate it to the context of research all right thank you professor and another question is from rihana what is the relevance of phenomenology to the quantitative research is her first question and second question is what is the clear line of difference between exploratory research and explanatory research okay uh, number one uh, phenomenology uh, research basically is in qualitative we do not really use in quantitative research we don't uh, we don't most of the time unless if you are doing a content analysis a new research that new approach that we use um, uh, i do have one student who has done uh, uh, content analysis and use quantitative analysis is possible okay but uh, most of the qual quantitative research you do not really use phenomenology approach okay and that's the first one uh, the second one i'm sorry what is it brother irfan the second, second question is, uh, what is the clear line of difference Okay, okay. I'm, I, I got it. Explanatory, basically, we are trying to explain the phenomenon and providing some kind of solution to it. Exploratory, we are going deeper into it. Explanatory is quantitative. Exploratory is more on qualitative. Uh, when you do quantitative, we have a defined boundary. We do not cross that boundary. So the kind of data I have, I can only answer based on the data I have. But qualitative. Once I collect the data, I feel it's not enough. Then I can move on and move on and continue and continue collecting new and new data. And finally, I try to uh, reach a solution to that. Okay. I, I think, uh, Doctor Irfan, there is a question uh, from Anamol. Uh, I think there is a question there. It says, "Population is forty thousand plus. Is it possible to get name list of all or non probability sampling?" We need to name uh, of samples only 380 uh, only. Please uh, answer my question. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, Islam is asking that question. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good. To get to get the name. Of, okay. Possible. Yeah. If, if you do not get if you do Sampling. not get the list of all respondents, uh, then definitely you have to go to non-probability sampling. You have to. There, there's no way you can do probability sampling. That's the first criteria uh, that it has to, that has to be made if you are going for probability sampling. Okay. Now there are cases where you can even get a list of people of uh, millions of people. For example, uh, if you want to do a study on a locality, and uh, the list of population can be obtained from a statistical department. You know, uh, 
if you are doing a study on bank and you want to do only study on the bank uh, CEOs and uh, MDs, those list is obtainable. All right. So it depends on the kind of research problem and the, the scope of your research. So if you can obtain, if you can obtain, then you go to probably the sampling. If you cannot obtain, you have to go for non-probably sampling. There are experts now are giving. Uh, they are questioning whether probability sampling is possible. <laughs> okay, the researchers are giving that probability sampling is not possible at all. Why? Because they argue that even you obtain the list of respondents, and when you are collecting data at that time from the list, some people may have already expired. Some people may have retired. Some people may have changed from one industry to another industry. Thus, the list we have may not be really valid always. So there are arguments that probably the sample is impossible. There are arguments, but I won't say that. <laughs> uh, there are cases where probability sampling is possible. And uh, when it's not possible, you have to go for non probability sampling. So for larger population, possibly you have to go for non probability sampling. Professor, not sampling. Yes. And one of the participants, it is from Asif Charag. He says, the question goes like, what do we mean by we have successfully validated the theory in our study context? Yes. Uh, basically, uh, when you have developed theoretical framework from a theory and you found that all hypotheses are accepted, uh, then you have validated the theory. Okay. And uh, if you have introduced a new variable and you have tested and you found hypothesis accepted, then you are extending the model. And uh, if you form a theory, you drop one dimension with some argument and input a new model, a uh, new variable there, then that would be you are modifying a model. OK, uh, so there are many different ways of doing it. And if you are using dimension of a variable uh, uh, theory as variables and you found hypothesis are rejected, then you are nullifying the theory. So there are many different approaches of doing it, nullifying theory, validating theory, verifying a theory, uh, uh, modifying a theory, extending a theory. You may even integrate theories. You can take two, three theories together and propose a new framework and you test it. And then you might be combining few theories. So you are integrating theories. That is also possible. Thank you, Professor. Another question is from one of the participants, Sabah And her question is, convenience sampling has occurred a negative connotation. How to tackle that? Well. Um, Convenience sample is same as uh, random sampling. In a random sampling, uh, we have the list. And from the list, we randomly select them. Convenience sample, I don't have the list, but I choose them as convenient to me. So it does have some connotation and some weaknesses. So possibly, you may proceed to judgment sampling that could be uh, better than the convenience sampling. Like in probability sampling, the systematic sampling, we have list of respondents and we choose respondents based on a system. Just mental sampling or purposive sampling, uh, we choose people based on uh, certain criteria. You know, as long as that serves the respondent serves the purpose of my research, then we select. So I'm not using my convenience; rather, I'm using some criteria to select respondents. So in that case, uh, if convenience sampling is not very useful, you might pro uh, you know proceed to. Uh, uh, choose judgmental or purposive sampling. If your sample size is very large, then convenient sample would be better. Your sampling is not too large, then you use judgmental or purposive sampling. Professor, can we just have a uh, you know clarity on what would be qualifying the large and you know where we can draw that line of having large sample and going for some okay. convenient sampling. Right. Uh, it's very difficult to say what is large okay. and what is not large. But uh, if, if, you, if you say, for example, your sample size uh, target population is few hundred thousand, uh, then definitely is very large. Even 100,000 is considered large. Uh, so if your target population about 30,000, 40,000, I think, uh, we wouldn't uh, define that as large rather than medium size of, you know. So in that case, we might use a convenience sampling. Say, for example, you are doing a study on customer satisfaction of mobile phone in a small area. 
So in that case, your total number of respondents could be only 20,000 or 30,000. That is considered smaller. In that case, convenient sampling can be used. You can just go to your supermarket or restaurants and pick up people and request them to fill in possible. All right. But if you are doing a study on a larger location, like whole India or whole Pakistan or whole Pakistan, uh, Malaysia, then definitely the number of responses are so huge, uh, you may not be able to use the husbandal sampling, rather use convenient sampling. All right. Thank you. Professor, another question is from Bilal Ahmed, and it is, is it possible to bear in mind all the nuts and bolts while uh, going through the research completed within the given time frame? Uh, <laughs> uh, if you have all the parts, and if you didn't uh, tie them with bolts and nuts, then you don't have the machine. <laughs> OK. <laughs> So if you uh, conduct a research, then all boards and nuts and boards has to be there, definitely there. Research is a very systematic, organized uh, effort by a researcher. And it has certain systematic scientific process that got to be followed. And uh, depending on institution, uh, do you have uh, formatting guidelines uh, and thesis writing guidelines or, or journal will have their own formats and guidelines. So you have to follow that. You have to follow that. So if you follow the guidelines given by university or guideline given by a journal, you would know exactly what are the nuts and bolts. So all should be there. If anyone missing, it's going to be incomplete. All right. So you have to keep in mind all that. In any research you do, especially if you are doing PhD, then we expect to have philosophical foundation. We expect you, you to have theoretical foundation. When you say philosophical foundation, then positivism, constructivism, inductive, deductive, qualitative, quantitative, all will come in. Research design, which kind of research design, it is going to be there, automatically going to be there. You know, there's no way you can avoid those, you know. So all nuts and bolts got to be there. Any nuts missing, you will have trouble defending, okay? Even any bolts missing, this is a serious problem. Like when I introduced the template to plot the research problem, I said the students will always have knowledge gap or theoretical gap, but they're very poor showing the contextual industry gap. That's the bolt. That's not the bolt. That's the nuts. You know, you have to tie up with the nuts. So if that nut is missing during the proposal defense of final viva voce, you will suffer. Those of us we have done the PhD, we know how difficult it is. So you got to have that support. So that that meaning that all bolts and nuts must be there. If you are driving a car. And that car missing a bolts and nuts. Can you drive that car? It's going to be dangerous, right? <laughs> you may have accident at any time. So you may not call it a complete car. Now, if you want to sell a car and you tell the uh, uh, customer, uh, my car, there is a problem with the gear, meaning there is a problem of bolts, you know, <laughs> so small parts of it. Or maybe you say my tire is uh, four or five years old. So you got a problem there, you know. So this is small, small problem that affects the quality of the car. So in a research, quality of research will be affected if you miss any of the NARS or both. Absolutely. And I would like to add, like, when these uh, professors, like uh, Professor Islam, go for PhD, defense evaluation, and VIVA, they do test how tightly those nuts and bolts are in the uh, research framework. So it is important that we have the nuts and bolts in place and we tie them. Uh, tightly so that it doesn't make noise kind of just like a vehicle uh, is being uh, you know run on the car we just cross check everything is in place so we just check that all the nuts and bolts are there and they are tightly and before we uh, end this we have more questions and it is related to the question uh, the participant is asking do banks share the list of their customers for the purpose of sampling it is, I think, linked to the previous question which you have answered. Yeah. Part of that question. Yeah. Yes, yes. Uh, you may not have uh, uh, the bank may not share with you. The bank may not share the customer list with you. Uh, in that case, you may not be able to do probability sampling. That's what I said, right? If you can obtain, follow probability sampling. If you cannot obtain, you have to follow non-probability sampling. You got no choice. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is it from the question-answer session, and it was great 
again, uh, Professor Islam, to have you with us today. Uh, it was a wonderful session. I think participants uh, have been exposed to all the nuts and bolts of research, and it's very, very informative. And we look forward to see you in the future. Also, in this webinar series, we'll, uh, Professor has uh, expertise in uh, statistical techniques, quantitative data analysis using SPSS, SPLS, and other things. And I also encourage participants to subscribe Professor's channel, which has over uh, 50 plus views on. Uh, Research topics and different fields of research, which a PhD scholar undergoes right from the time he joined PhD until the time he uh, completes his or defends his PhD. So we can uh, make use of these resources. Thank you, Professor, for being us, being with us. It was great. Thank you for accepting our invitation. Thank you.